you know, trying to capture those real authentic moments that are, that are happening when nobody's noticing the cameras behind or trying to act or not act or, or they feel weird that, you know, shutter button's clicking. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Remote No Pressure Podcast. Very excited to be here, Bill. It's just a great day. It's great to be back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yes, exactly. Well, you know, this week we've got an unbelievable photographer. Yeah. Brian Gregson, who travels around with Yellow Dog, uh, doing all kinds of globe trotting and taking pictures. Have you ever seen a picture, Bill, like a, a photograph? Several or- times. <laughs> <laughs> You're in rare form today. I apologize. Bill. Uh, have you ever seen a picture that's just really like taking your breath away? I like, have. Yeah. yeah, I forgot it now though. You forget. <laughs> I, can, have you ever taken? It was it? so amazing. I forgot it as soon as I walked away. Let me ask you this question: Have you ever seen a picture that you'll never forget? Yes, I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know that picture. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it's funny because with the rise of Instagram, uh, the rise of social media, you know, there's pictures everywhere. Mm-hmm. And you know, we've had some awesome people uh, on our podcast who are fishing guides who have added um, photography to their fly fishing guide guiding business yeah. and things like that. And it's, it's really helped their business. What do you, I mean, do you think we're oversaturated with f- photos now? Like, yeah, uh, I think so. I think there's a lot. I mean, like with with the smartphone, the camera phones coming up ten years ago, fifteen years ago, uh-huh. to the smartphones that we got now. Uh, everybody's got an amazing digital camera in their pocket. Not everybody knows how to use them, right? You know, every, right. there's always that uh, the vertical versus the horizontal shots that still drives everybody nuts. Uh-huh. You know, but uh, there's a lot more photography out there. I don't. I wouldn't call half of it professional, though. I mean, like a lot of people don't know how to frame the shot. A lot of people don't know what they're looking for. They're like, oh, I'm going to take a picture of my meal here. Right. And uh, well, send that off to the internet. Land. It's, it's funny because used to, you know, and I, I don't know if I've had this discussion before on here, but before, I mean, you couldn't take a billion pictures. You know, you took whatever's on the roll of film. Yeah. 12 or 24. Or tw- what, I yeah. can't remember. And and then you have to take it to, to get printed. Yep. You know, and so... And you, know, you didn't know what you had until you had it printed. Until it came home. Unless yep. you had those Polaroids. Remember the Polaroids? Oh, yeah. And, uh, and you'd have to shake it. Yep. That's so sweet. Some crazy photos. We bought a house. My wife and I found some. Well, my wife and I bought a house when mm-hmm. we first got married. And in the rafters of the basement, we found the shoebox. And the previous tenant, I guess, had some like um, very scandalous photos of his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and they were, they were Polaroids. <laughs> and I guess he had hid it from his wife. Oh wow! <clears throat> in in the rafters of this, um, did he ever come knocking looking for his box? He did not. But here's what's so funny because um, I'm pretty sure he grew weed yeah. in the house as well. Uh, when we were getting the house inspected, um, we had like this. <laughs> I had some crazy stories. We, I get the house inspected. We had the electrical law tested, and the guy's like, "Man, you've got enough power down here to to run the whole <laughs> to run the whole uh, you know block." And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, I'm super naive because, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in the profession of growing marijuana, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, but I was like, <clears throat> and I'm, you know, I'm not super familiar with it. I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, this guy, you know, I don't, he goes, well, what did the guy do? The electrician. I'm like, I don't know. He just, <laughs> I guess he just want to make sure enough power. So, so then like I found these lights, you know, like, um, you know, that you grow lights. Yeah. Yeah. Grow lights, but there were no bulbs in them, but they were the lights. Yeah. In this back room of the basement, and I thought, oh, I'm, I don't know why they have these here. <laughs> so, like ten years later, as I become more familiar with the marijuana industry here in Michigan, I'm like, that sucker was growing weed down there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of funny. To I don't know, I, I I was just so naive when I moved in. I'm like, oh, that's neat. The guy just wanted extra power, but really, he was like, <laughs> had a grow house going on down there, but. Yeah, but that but yeah, we found this box of Polaroid pictures mm-hmm. and it was like I was like, "Oh my god." And you could tell they were old and and it, and it wasn't his wife. <laughs> so it was probably his ex-girlfriend or something or maybe it was a tenant's before that a boot knife. It was a boot knife in there. I still have the boot knife. It's pretty sweet. Huh. Yeah. They, that was their that was a little treasure trove up in the rafters that nobody knew about. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of funny. How would you stick a boot knife up there though? Is are are they illegal or were they I, I really? don't know. I don't Again, know. The laws being the naive yeah. person, uh, but it was in the shoebox, you know, that uh, the pictures and then a couple other random notes, 
you know, letters and stuff. It was a curse like, on the box if you open it. Right. Like, yeah, like that Brady Bunch episode. I started wearing <laughs> that. That, that uh, it was like some doll from Hawaii that I wore around my neck. I just, whoa, this is going to work. <laughs> Where did we go? Photo- photography. Go ahead. But photography, you know, <laughs> I think it's changed a lot now. The art of photography. Yeah. You know, so there's like artists, which is Brian Gregson, because I mean, if you look at some of his stuff, it's art, you know, I could go out there and I can take a million pictures with my phone and one of them will come out. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I think that ticks off a lot of the artists. Yeah, but with Brian, it's like when you look at his stuff, it's not just like he took a billion pictures and this is what came out. He's an artist Mm -hmm. and I respect that and unfortunately the art of photography has really gotten diluted over the years. I think technology has done that to almost everything though. Look at the recording industry. Yeah, you know 30 years ago if you wanted to record an album you had to go to a studio that had like a high-end tape system right or 30 years ago they'd be like ADAT that kind of stuff but with pro tools everybody can um or the DAW for that matter everybody has a computer at home anybody can have a studio at home so the art behind it has really died yeah the studios popped up all over like here in Grand Rapids there's probably a dozen like small studios but like maybe only two or three that actually are legit that have tape still Mm-hmm. They can do it the old school way, right? But even of those, who knows how craftful the engineers are? Craftful, cra- cra- yeah, Crafty? artistic, artistic. Yes. Well, no. How how many of them actually know how to use the tools they got? Sure. You know. Sure. You can have a shed full of tools, but if you don't know how to use them, they're just no good. Well, they also have plugins for two inch tape. Oh yeah. So that's kind of an audio file discussion, but you know, there's a saturation that you get on mm-hmm. that two inch tape, and so now they have a plugin for that. Yep. So you don't even need the tape, but it sounds like tape. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so I'm, I was very fascinated to talk to Brian and, and to have him here on the podcast as he talks a little bit about his art of, of photography. And we thank you guys so much for being here. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, well, thanks, Brian, for hanging out with us. We we really appreciate it. And we, we appreciate your story. And we, we really appreciate what um, you're contributing to the uh, fly fishing community. I I saw. Did, did you do the film Dubai on the Fly at the fly fishing film tour? Was that was that you or? Yeah, yeah. I um, I helped film that with uh, Off the Grid um, Studios, which is uh, R.A. Biotti. Oh, okay. So I, I do a lot of work with with uh, with those guys. Well, that's that's a that was a great film. What was it like being in Dubai? I mean, I, when I think of Dubai, I don't think of fishing, and I didn't realize that you know, the fishing culture and heritage was so strong there, but what was it, what was it like there? Go, was that your first time in Dubai or have you, had you been there before? You know, I, I, I had been in Dubai before. I've never been there for fishing. Um, but I, I was a little bit familiar with, with the kind of the layout and what Dubai is all about. Um, but I've never really had to experience, um, a, a long length of time there. So it was, it was really cool. It was really eye opening. Um, it was really neat. It was neat to see uh, the queen fish, which was a uh, you know a fish that I've never seen before, and I was quite shocked on on how aggressive they were and how you know how hard they pull. And you know it's all sight fishing, kind of top water fishing. So that was really cool. And and the culture is really neat too. Some of it, uh, you know, come from the Rockies. We we don't get to see any of any of that kind of deal. Yeah, no, no kidding. Now you spend a tremendous time, a tremendous time behind the camera, both both uh, the video camera, uh, the film, and also uh, you know taking photographs. How how much do you actually get to fish when you're on these trips? Do you get to fish a lot, or is it more down to business? You know, as as time goes on, I became pretty satisfied with angling, if that makes sense. Where I still fish when I, when I want to, um, for like this kind of film, I mean, you're working, you're working every day. It's 18 hour days. It's before sun up and well after, uh, sundown, but there's always ample time where you kind of got everything. And it's, you know, for a lot of the camera crew, it's like, Hey, do you want to try to get one? Hmm. And it's like, sure. You know, I mean, it's a species checklist and, and I'm pretty easily satisfied where, you know, if I, if I can get one to hand and one eats and it's a kind of cool visual experience, I like to fish everything kind of visually on top water if I can. And, and, and that's just, that's really satisfying to me. And I don't, I'm not really kind of after the numbers uh, or the size of fish anymore. It's just kind of just enjoying that, uh, that, uh, that moment, I suppose. 
Now, when I was younger, that was way different. I wanted a ton of fish. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I wanted them bigger, but but as time goes on and, and working behind cameras and 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 stuff, uh, I kind of fish through the angler as well. So I I kind of enjoy both. So speaking about about you, Brian, and you know, you just mentioned when you were a kid. I mean, you you have quite a history and, you know, reading about, about your history there on Brian Gregson, photography.com. We'll put that um, link in the show notes, but you know, you, you've been on quite a journey. Now w- your, your father had, had passed away when, when you were a teenager. Am I right? Correct. Yeah. My, my father passed away from uh, multiple sclerosis when I was a kid. And that was, uh, at the time that was a really big deal. Um, in my life and we had fished together. I mean, I fished my whole family fished, my grandfather's fished and that was kind of my last fishing partner. And so, you know, kind of slingshotted my life into all kinds of places and experiences. And it, it was a wild ride in the beginning, but it all worked out in the end. You spend a lot of time surfing in Hawaii, right? I did. I ended up moving to Hawaii and, uh, I stayed there for quite a bit. It was a really cool experience. Um, not only culturally, but just I'm way out of my element. I'm super young. Um, I was really into board sports already. So surfing was came, you know, not naturally, I suppose, because surfing is pretty tough, but I had spent some time going to school in California. So I kind of learned the ocean at a younger age then. And it was an easier progression to get kind of in the water. Do you think, I mean, you know, your dad passing away, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people, uh, where I'm from, where, where I live now, not where I'm from, but where I'm from, um, you know, who grow up, whose parents, you know, stay married. Um, they go off to college, they get a great job, they get married, they have kids and they never experience any kind of tragedy in their life. They never experience any brokenness in their life. And it's, it's almost like they, they sometimes lack empathy. Um, and, you know, th- that's a great journey. I would have loved to experience that myself, but unfortunately I didn't experience that. And, um, you know, and your, your father passed away when you were really young, you know, as, as a young person, I mean, did it really change your outlook on life and, and made you want to do things a little bit differently after your dad passed? I mean, do you think you, I don't know how to put it. Um, accessed some wisdom that you probably wouldn't have gotten had you not gone through that? Absolutely. Um, I feel that, you know, certainly at the time and kind of leading up to it, it was, it's, it's a little different, I suppose, than maybe losing someone from like a car accident where it's like a real shocker. Mm -hmm. Um, where when someone has multiple sclerosis, at least in our case was, it's a slow death if that makes sense, it's slow dying. It's watching someone that you really care about slowly over the years just kind of wither away. So you've kind of mentally prepared for it, but you're never really prepared for it, especially at that age. At least I wasn't. And so I think that I w- I've always been a pretty adventurous soul. Um, my family was very adventurous and outdoors. And so it's kind of always been with me since, since I've been yet little and I think it was kind of like, okay, you know, this, you know, all hell's broke loose and I'm just going to grab my backpack and take my stuff and I'm just going to hop on a plane and I, I'm pretty self-sufficient. At least I thought I was, and I pretty much was at that age, but, and just kind of just going to venture and what was supposed to be maybe like a summer, like lasted, you know, years. <laughs> 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 How did you end up behind a camera? I mean, were you always into photography or did that something that was that something that kind of slowly evolved as well? You know, no, everything kind of my whole life's been around just like random acts. Um, I had been I had moved back from from Hawaii and I was commercial fishing in the summertime on the East Coast and doing snow sports in the wintertime and all my friends and roommates were at the time were you know, up and coming athletes, photographers, cinematographers, or well established athletes. And so it was kind of one thing uh, led to another where I was in these, you know, just kind of riding with these guys and these crews and our friends. And, and you know, there's cameras there. And, and years went on where I was on a shoot and I hurt, got really hurt on a, uh, a night shoot. And I blew up my knee and I shattered most of my teeth. 
uh, eventually a couple days later with another big accident. And so one thing about another was I worked behind the cameras and so it was kind of an easier transition to, you know, I knew the snowpack so I can log up cameras. I can run a B camera because I kind of know what they're looking for and it's film days. So it really matters. You can't just go out there and just click the buttons or run, you know, eight millimeter or something like 16 millimeter and just hope for the best. Right. right. Uh, it's very expensive. So, you know, it was a, at the time it was like my no career was over that I never really had. And I was kind of like, what am I going to do? And I've always fished. And so I just ended up bringing a camera with me um, everywhere I went just for, just for whatever purposes. There was really no, no end all be all purpose of that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of stumbled into it just by sheer luck. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, the, the thing is, with with modern day technology you know you see a lot of stuff with um you know with the iphone you know um you know that we've seen this crazy change in technology where you can take some awesome pictures um without necessarily a lot of knowledge but it seems like you know when i'm going through your stuff brian um it is there's a soul behind it it's an artwork still it's an art form and, you know, um, you don't always get that. You, can, you can't, that's not something you can replicate with technology. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for those words. And I, I, I agree. And I think, that's, I think that's the hope behind probably most people who do photos or video or, or art or artistic is that, you know, you kind of leave, you kind of want to, it's all about emotion, right? So you kind of want to evoke something that, the, you know, I think that over time when I keep looking at all my photos, I mean, I'm definitely not evoking emotion every click of the button, but you know, sometimes you look at old photos and for me, it's about remembering like maybe that time or that moment or that trip. And then you, at the time when you're seeing the photos, you know, you, you try to at least capture something that would at least instill something in somebody else. Mm -hmm. At least the hope. I suppose. <clears throat> how long? How long have you been doing this gig? How, how long have you been you doing know, fly fishing? I've been seeing fly fishing. I think I first got published probably two thousand and eight or maybe two thousand and six. Okay. So fly fishing has been has been a good good ten year run. So it's been interesting. Everything's evolved over a quickly amount of time, especially with cameras. Yeah, you know, and we've I've talked to a lot of different people. Um, you know, photographers and artists, you know, we've talked about the evolution of a film, you know, um, you know, used to, you take a picture and you give it, you know, the film to your mom, she goes down to the grocery store and she's not paying for extra for the one hour film, you know, she's going to send it off somewhere and then you kind of have to wait and see if you took good pictures or not, you know, as a kid, you know, it's like a whole other world. Right. And, and now it's like, I see some of these like, um, I saw a photographer the other day and she's just taking a million pictures. Well, if you take a million pictures, one of them is probably going to be okay. You know, you just keep pushing right. the click button, you know, <laughs> it may take time. Hopefully. hopefully, hopefully, you know, so it's weird to see how we've progressed. And, um, but I've always said, you know, we, we've seen a lot of things getting replaced with, you know, um, AI, um, in artificial right. intelligence and stuff. And it's like, okay, all these things, you know, everything's changing so quickly, but something about the creative field, you know, with, uh, number one, our intellectual property laws, which are absolutely amazing in the United States, if people abide by them. And then also the, um, the fact that it is an art, you know, that people can re may be able to replace you if you're working on a line at a factory, you know, just doing an every, you know, just putting a screw into a machine, but when you're creating something, you know, that is not something you can really uh, replace with artificial intelligence. I, I, I would agree. Um, I, I think especially if you're trying to ev evoke emotion. I, I suppose if I was doing maybe studio work and I had to photograph a watch, you know, yeah, maybe a robot or artificial intelligence can make a watch on it black background or white background or something, but I think it's, it's hard to like taking a portrait, I think would be tough because 
you do, you do have to have some sort of, you're trying to evoke some sort of connection in just one photo. Mm. You, you've, you've been a lot of places. I mean, you're, you're going, you're doing, I mean, you're, you're traveling with people, but you've also had a lot of magazine covers. Um, can you tell me, can you tell us, do you remember the first time you had a, you got a cover? I do. Um, the first time I got a cover, ironically, was from another photographer who at the time when I was a kid, he was an athlete in the ski world and he was on all kinds of covers himself. His name is Brian O'Keefe and he owns what's called Catch Magazine. And Brian and I had crossed paths and exchanged information and he was running a new magazine at the time, which was Catch. And he wanted this, this photo for the cover and he was just starting up. So there's no budget to really buy photos. And I'm kind of just starting up. So I, I'm kind of like leaning on, okay, I just be good for the portfolio. And lo and behold, he ran it on cats and Volvo called me. Mm. And that was my first big sell. And they bought the image and they ran it for four years across Scandinavia for the opening um, marketing for their Volvo XC, I believe. And so that was a big deal. And now it's like, you know, the first cover and then it just turned into um, something else bigger. And that kind of just snowballed into where I am now. What was it like getting, did Volvo called you? Yeah. I mean, what was, was that like? like? I mean, were you like, who is this? Or you think it's a prank call from your buddies or something? I mean, what's it like to get a yeah, call from you? I got an email and it's kind of like, you know, I read the email and, you know, I really don't know. I can't really decipher, you know, email marketing jargon. And, you know, so I kind of sent up to a friend of mine and it was like, is this for real? Like, I want to set up a conference call. And, yeah, so one thing led to another and, you know, they called and, and uh, worked out a uh, an agreement and a payment and a rights usage. And, and the one thing led to another and they'd call after the rights were over and they'd buy it again and, it was kind of a, it was very surreal. That's really, really cool. That's something that you don't forget. You know, that's something that, you know, you talk, you talk about like the dots, you know, you, you connected with this guy who was a, you know, a snow guy, you know, um, a ski guy, you know, and you connect, you exchange information, you grow, you know, and then all of a sudden it leads to a deal with Volvo. What, I mean, you can't, you can't predict that when you set out as an artist or you set out as a photographer, you can't predict those kind of things to happen. No, I just, I've, I've just gotten really lucky. And it was really cool. The photo was a place uh, on the Provo River in Utah um, with a friend of mine. There's a bunch of friends there. And the, the angler Scott Dickey. And, it was, you know, we left at like 4 in the morning. It's freezing cold. I mean, you can't even make a tap. <laughs> it's that cold. But there's like cool frost on the trees and it's snowing. It's got the whole winter scene kind of going on. So it was really cool that it was like that photo because it was, you know, we were just kind of out there just taking photos and just kind of going out for fun. And it kind of worked out to, you know, turn into be a very, uh, like photo by all kinds of people. That's really cool. That's very, very cool. Um, so you've done, you've done some with Volvo. Have you done any other international, uh, cells that you've, you've done, or is that the biggest one you've done? Yeah, that's definitely by far the biggest, uh, <laughs> the biggest one I've, I've done for, uh, for sure. Well, that's awesome, Brian. So, what's what's next for you? I know you're you're with Yellow Dog, right? So, do you you go out with them and take pictures of of clients and things like that, or what is your role like? Yes, yeah, so I'm I uh, I work for Yellow Dog. I'm the I work for the director of photography, and my kind of role is basically gathering uh, media content, whether it be photography or or video. But uh, I kind of work with all their different sales agents, and those guys are. Uh, very boots on the ground and personal uh, hands-on. And so they are constantly traveling in their regions and they're needing to update photography for various reasons. Either it was outdated or, you know, we changed rooms or lodges get updated or, you know, personnel's new. And so I just kind of work with all those guys and travel uh, wherever they need me. So a very lucky gig. Yeah, it sounds like a great gig. And, and, you know, one of the things that you said that, um, you know, you, you don't you normally respond to interviews or like talking about yourself because you, you like 
the work to speak for itself and and it's and you've done a great job that's for sure um so that's why you, you say you got lucky but i mean it's, things like that don't happen by accident you know i mean yeah there's there's some <laughs> there's some breaks that happen but i i heard this quote one time i yeah. can't i can't remember what it was but it was like um who said it but it was like um the opportunity of a lifetime has to be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity you know and when the opportunity, when opportunity presents itself, you know, I mean, you hadn't had years of experience and um, a depth of creativity from from your life experiences, you know, that even though that opportunity may have been there, um, you may not have taken advantage of that. You know what I mean? They may have not have reached out to you. So, yeah, you're, you may have gotten lucky or a few breaks, but you've also worked very hard and you can't. You can't discount that, Brian. <laughs> Very true. No, I mean, you do work hard. Uh, I think that for me to be where I'm standing right now, I had a lot of help, too. There's so many people along the way. I mean, hundreds of people that have gone out of their way to support me in all kinds of different reasons and ways where, I mean, I literally would not be here without everybody else believing in me. And it's you know, it's, I've always, you know, when you get kind of interviews and, and people want to, you know, ask questions or inquisitive and you're curious. It's I always just feel, it always feels awkward. It's like, I'm just a random dude with a camera. <laughs> I don't really don't have anything <laughs> interesting to say. There's so many other interesting people out there. I think that's why I like the camera where it's, I can just kind of observe, observe them. Um, and so if you kind of feel like you're on the other side of the lens, so it definitely, no, I know how everybody else feels. <laughs> <laughs> but but do you think though, like going inward, like you know, if you're more of an introverted person or you know, you like to be, you know, behind the scenes and I mean the amount of content that you have consumed, the amount of people that you've just watched and when you see things, you probably recognize or notice things that I would never see because I I haven't spent years behind a camera. But do you think being kind of separated from everything has <clears throat> has just given you a depth? of um, understanding of humans, I think. Because, I mean, it's really psychology, you know, like what you're doing and how you're looking at people. Do you feel that, or is it just your personality, you're more introverted, and it really hasn't made a difference, you think? I think that over over my photography career and as my traveling has broadened over the years, I found myself using a long lens, to get away from people. I felt like that when you have a short lens and I'm a wide angle, I'm kind of right, you're like right in their face all the time. So you, you don't, you know, people are either uptight or they make me do a, they might do is like a, you know, make their face kind of, you know, different posture or something because they know the camera's on them. But when I remove myself from the area with a longer lens, people forget that you have a camera because I'm way over there. And so I think that you, you can kind of get more real shots, like feeling shots, if that makes sense, where you kind of, where more natural, where it's, you can, you kind of have a time to more or less like observe somebody. And I kind of, kind of sound weird. <laughs> no, kind no, of no, 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 no. Looking at somebody it. through a viewfinder for eight hours and, you know, trying to capture those real authentic moments that are, that are happening when nobody's noticing that camera's behind or trying to act or not act or, or they feel weird that, you know, shutter button's clicking. Yeah, I, I totally get, we, we did some interviews with a, a group of, of, um, fly fishing guides this early in the fall this year. And it was our first like on location live interviews. And we're doing this whole like campfire thing and, we've got all these mics out and cause we don't have lapel mics. Um, right. you know, and there's like <clears throat> all these different mics in different places and we're trying to get it right. And then there's the wind blowing and it's driving us nuts, but we're trying to like manage it. And it was just not the same. It didn't have the same authentic authenticity as it would. I think if people, you know, had on some lapel mics or something where they kind of forgot that they're getting recorded, you know, I think, right. I think it would definitely would have been more genuine or, or they would have felt more comfortable than, than maybe they would have. They, like, I didn't feel like it captured what I was trying to capture because everything was like in their face, like you were saying. It, it's, de- it's definitely, I, I learned that 
very well in Bolivia when I was with the Samani tribe there. And when I had a short lens and the lens was kind of, they saw the camera, they would kind of, you know, very good posture. You know, they look at the camera and they would <laughs> smile. And that's a great photo and all, but that's kind of not what I was after. I kind of wanted more of kind of a natural setting, natural environment. And so I swapped lenses and kind of went away from where everybody was. And they kind of just forgot I was there. And that's kind of like, okay, I'm just going to kind of start, you know, exploring this avenue a little more here and here. And I'd do the same thing in Dubai when we were on the, uh, on the commercial vessel where every time that the captain would see my camera, he would, you know, look at me and smile and give me this pose and, I really didn't want that. I, I kind of wanted just a natural shot of him. That takes some experience, and I think that takes some uh, maturity to be able to pull yourself back and capture things that maybe a younger photographer or someone anxious to get a shot may not be able to to get. It's definitely, it's definitely been interesting. Um, you know, it's, and maybe it's you know, traveling definitely makes you think about things. You know, currently I spend probably more time out of the country than in the country. And so you definitely maybe have a different perspective on on things, I suppose. I love coming home. Um, I love Montana. It's We have so much to offer here. Um, we have huge open lands and there's a lot of hunting and fishing here. And so when you go to places that have like 20 million people in a small condensed place, on your way to, you know, some other fishing destination definitely makes you think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I grew up in Houston, Houston, Texas. I gotcha. Uh, big city, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and now I live in this cornfield somewhere in the Midwest. And, you know, there's like traffic jams, which is basically like right now is harvest time. So they're like harvesting all the, the corn and soy. And so right. it, ba- it backs up traffic, and that's a traffic jam here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and yep. I'm I'm pretty close to Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm I'm um kind of in a kind of a suburb of, of Grand Rapids, but I'm a little south of that suburb, and kind of in the middle of not nowhere, but you know, I, I live out a bit. And it was so funny because one day I'm driving home, and I'm I'm driving through these like rolling hills with big, you know. The rolls of hay on the the hills, and I'm like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I could never go back to the city and feel feel human again, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's like it, it's so it's so different. I, I went to Chicago uh, back in September for a Trot Unlimited event in um, downtown Chicago, and it was excellent. We had a great time, and it was fun. Um, but I felt like a hazy coming into town, like Gomer Pyle or something, like. I didn't know how to park, <laughs> like, like, you know, $5 for a cup of coffee. And I, I think I spent 30 bucks in parking and I'm like, what is going on right now? <laughs> it's like, exactly. You know, it was just, I, I, when I was younger, it was like, oh yeah, let's, let's experience the, the older I get it. Like you said, I guess, I guess I'm, um, seeing, uh, I like looking at things with a, a longer lens, I guess, like you were saying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always nice to see. I mean, I like going to the city because you're only there for a couple of days. So it's like, oh, you know, that was really nice. But mm-hmm. man, I could never live there. It's, I think I would get anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so much people, so much traffic. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how, you know, busy cities take like Buenos Aires, for instance. There's nobody like really abides by any traffic laws, but yet it flows really well. And there's millions of people there. It always floors me of how this even happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I, I went to India um, a while back, and you know, you were backpacking through there, and there are no rules for traffic. You know, I, I don't know how right. I don't know how like they survive. There are no rules. There's there are suggestions, but there are no right. rules. Like it was. <laughs> I remember sure getting you were with a good driver. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I remember getting off the plane in Delhi and I'm like, what is going on right now? Like I, I'd never been 
to India before. So I get off and, you know, we get picked up by a driver and he's just driving and it's like one in the morning and the place is just, you know, traffic everywhere. And I'm, I'm going to die. This is, this is the last time, you know, I'm going to be alive. Right. <laughs> I need to call my family and tell them, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it was crazy. And that could, I don't know how people, but they do, they adapt where humans and humans are amazing species. That's for sure. So you've traveled a lot. I mean, have you ever felt uh, have you ever had any crazy stories like fear for your life or did you ever, have you ever had something happen crazy to you when you were on your travels, Brian? I think that, you know, for me, most of my travels have been the crazy stories would kind of just be the same as stories at home. You know, it's like you can get in a traffic accident around home as you can, um, traveling somewhere else. I've for the most part, I've had pretty, smooth sailing. I mean, there's definitely, you know, some sketchy spots, but I think for the most part, I've had more, more issues traveling to bigger cities than the U.S. <laughs> anywhere. Um, but I definitely learned that that people are willing to help everywhere. And, and it's been pretty eye opening because half the time I have to use a translator. You know, my Spanish is terrible. I try my best or, there's a language I don't know how to speak and it's definitely been very eye opening for me to realize that we're kind of all basically humans and we all come from different walks of life and everybody kind of wants the same thing. Everybody just wants to be healthy and happy and provide for their families and, and enjoy life. Um, and so it's been really cool to have people basically invite you into their lives and guides and, the homes of their guides and, and people from all over. So no matter where you go, you're seeing those common threads, you know, they want to take care of their family. They want to have good relationships with their family and enjoy life for those kind of the things that you see, regardless of the cultures that you visit. I think for the most cultures I see, I spent a lot of time in central and South America. Um, I'd say the majority of my time out of the country is there. And I say for the most part, they're very family oriented. Mm. Um, and they're also kind of community oriented, you know, whether I'm in Holbosch at Sam Flea's place and he's feeding, you know, a quarter of the town every day to, you know, I go to the Bahamas where they're inviting you to their home, you know, to have dinner with the rest of their family. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's just a lot like here. It's the same kind of deal. You know, people are, want to kind of take a break at the end of the day of work and spend time with their families and just kind of enjoy life. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Much easier here. Yeah. Um, It's amazing how similar we are regardless of where you go, you know, the whole human species, but what, what's next for you? I mean, you're, you said you're 43. Is that what you said? Yeah. 43. Okay. I had to think about that when you, when you're like, I don't know how old you are. And I was like, how old am I? (laughs) You're getting up there. Yeah, I feel so, like I'm 20. <laughs> My body feels like it's 90, but <laughs> so you're you're 40, yeah. you're 43. I mean, what's next for you? Are you going to continue doing this? Have you got anything coming up in the fly fishing film tour this year? What 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 are the things that are happening that's coming up? Uh, probably yeah. I'm going to continue just kind of just following life as it happens. It's kind of worked out for better or for worse and just kind of see where that goes. Yeah. We have a, a film coming out with off the grid studios for the fly fishing film tour. That's kind of in the editing docket right now. I leave on Sunday to teach a uh, on the water photography workshop in Belize for yellow dog. Hmm. And then I come home for, I think 72 hours and I go to Chile for three weeks. Well, where are you going in Chile? I'll be in the Southern, the Patagonia region. I have like a seven lodge, um, tour, which in, in, in photography world means a ton of work because you're trying to shoot from the rooms to the food, to the fishing, to the transportation at each place in, in a few short days. So it's, it's, uh, people think I'm always on vacation, but in reality it's, I sleep when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we we really appreciate you coming on in. Um, we'll share your your links um, for all your your work 
on the show notes, but if someone wanted to get a hold of you, if you're open to that or whatever, what's the best way for them to see your work or what's the best way for them to, to get a hold of you? Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, they can get a hold of me on my, my website and there's a, there's an email contact list in there. Um, Brian Gregson photography and the email address is pretty simple. It's Brian at Brian Gregson photography.com. Yes, I know it's very long, but someone had Brian Gregson, Brian Gregson photo for some reason. <laughs> so I got the long one. Some, some, uh, computer guy or, uh, computer programmer, video gamer has Jeff and he's, <laughs> he, and he's, oh <laughs> he's owned it since like 1999. And, uh, like I would love to have that domain, but it, and it's like very odd, like video game design. And then it's changed through the years. Don't ask me why I know that, but, um, (laughs) I'm stalking my own domain. Yeah. I'm stalking my own (laughs) domain. You know, it's like, I got to find out who this Jeff Troutman is. It's funny because when I was in college and I was, um, was in college down in Dallas and I worked uh, an investment firm and, you know, I was in college and I just helped, I just took phone calls for people trying to enroll in their 401k. And I worked second shift and went to college during the day. And the vice president of a private equity or something was named Jeff Troutman. And so I would get these emails, like invites to go play golf with senators and all this other stuff. And here I am, this call center bum, you know, but our <laughs> names are like <laughs> the same name. So I get all these weird emails and I'd forward it on to him and we would go back and forth. It was like, I was a 20 year old kid, you know, just trying to scrape through college and <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy. You know, this, this golf one sounds nice. I might want to go to this one. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was invited through a company email, so I guess I got to go. <laughs> yeah. Not going to happen, but well, we appreciate you nope. hanging, hanging out with us, Brian. And, um, we'll be sure to share your information with our, with our, um, with our audience and, um, good luck with your travels and, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Remote No Pressure Podcast. We're so happy and so excited every week that you tune in. We're just so grateful for our guests and for our listeners. Um, be sure to check out our website at remotenopressure.com. Follow us on our social media. And until next time, go fishing. Go fishing.